Boa tarde. Em primeiro lugar, eu queria agradecer a todos vocês pela presença. Uh, nós vamos ter hoje essa palestra de um tema bastante atual, o, a expansão do, do fascismo, no caso, o fascismo clerical no Entre Guerras, como isso se dava por uma rede internacional. Quem vai falar com a gente sobre isso hoje é a Nina Valbusquet, uh, que é, fez a, a graduação, o mestrado, o doutorado, Uh, na Escola de Ciências Políticas em Paris. Ela foi também, nesse período, pesquisadora visitante nas universidades de Columbia e Yale, nos Estados Unidos. Atualmente, ela vive nos Estados Unidos. Ela é pesquisadora visitante do Museu do Holocausto em Washington. E, em breve, vai ser professora visitante da Universidade Jesuíta de Fordham, em Nova York. Uh, a palestra vai ser em inglês, mas ela vai falar mais ou menos pausado. Uh, e depois as o, nós teremos os comentários aqui do professor Marcos Napolitano, é, professor titular aqui do Departamento de História, coordenador do Programa de Pós-Graduação em História Social, e que também tem pesquisa uh, relacionadas ao tema. E o, o debate, as perguntas e respostas vão ter tradução. Então, para quem está com muito medo do inglês, não precisa. Tá bom? Uh, teve o um show do Pink Floyd, foi em inglês, aí todo mundo se virou bem com isso. Tá bom? Então, vamos começar. Ok. Can you hear me? Ok. Um, so Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here, and uh, I'm sorry I cannot speak in Portuguese, but I hope the PowerPoint will help also um, to understand. So, um, to start right away, I would like to start with a visual example, um, which is the first, um, the first Brazil Brazilian version of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So, the text of the Protocols is a notorious anti-Semitic forgery, which uh, pretended to be a report of a series of meetings held in uh, Basel, Switzerland in uh, 1897, at the time of the first Zionist Congress. So in which uh, supposedly Jewish leaders uh, would have set a plan to subvert the entire uh, Christian civilization through the means of socialism and liberalism. So the document obviously was a fake, and it was forged in Russia around 1905 to blame Jews for revolutionary movements uh, in Russia. But it's only after the Bolshevik Revolution and the First World War that the document, uh, the protocol, started to circulate outside of Russia and in different translations. Uh, so this first Brazilian version, as you see here, uh, dated from 19. 36, and was edited by Gustavo Barroso. Uh, so this, this Brazilian version was largely inspired by two uh, French versions of the protocols from 1920. That was published by two, um, two French right-wing Catholics. So Roger uh, Lambelin was a monarchist act uh, activist, and Monseigneur Juin, on which I will focus more, was a Parisian priest. Both were supporters of the Action Française, which was a monarchist, anti-democratic political movement led by Charles Maurras. So this example of transatlantic circulation between France and Brazil uh, leads me to introduce a few considerations on this topic and on the scholarship about clerical fascism and transnational antisemitism. So first, um, right-wing and fascist internationalism is way less studied than left and communist internationalism. Um, and that for two reasons, obviously some ideological contradictions between uh, fascism, nationalism, and internationalism. And second reason, because uh, right-wing international ten tended to be less organized than left left-wing uh, internationals. They are, were more secretive, they work behind the scene, 
Uh, so which raise a problem of sources and archives, so how as, as historian we can access to these kind of right-wing networks. And it's usually through personal papers, letters, doing a little bit of micro-history and looking at the actors. Second consideration um, is that among the few studies that look at uh, right-wing and fascist internationalism, the religious dimension, the Catholic dimension of fascism, remain uh, neglected, like understudied. So for instance, in um, his um, classic studies of the protocols, the historian Norman Korn uh, talk about an anti-Semitic international in the 1930s, but he focused entirely on Nazi Germany and uh, completely overlooked the role played by Christianity in the diffusion of anti-Semitic propaganda. So I instead argue that Catholic networks were crucial vectors of transnational anti-Semitism, especially in the first diffusion of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in 1920. Um, so indeed, two of the first translators of the Protocols in French and Italian belong to the same group of uh, integralist Catholics. And so they were uh, Monseigneur Ernest Juin, in France, in Paris, were already, already mentioned before, and Monsignor Umberto Benini in uh, Rome. So in this presentation, I will follow this specific group of integralist Catholic, Catholics and how this network was then transformed into a network of clerical fascism. Um, so his, the, um, the historian John Pollard uh, defined clerical fascism as being a broad spectrum of clerics and lay Catholics who became fellow travelers or flankers of fascism, that I mean activists who bridge Catholic culture and fascist politics. And then third uh, quick uh, consideration in this introduction is about the complexity of clerical fascism and why we need more studies about that. Um, complexity and because of the contradictions of clerical fascism, which was at the same time modern and anti-modern, was political and religious, and it was national and transnational. And so that's why I will focus on the question of anti-Semitism as a key feature of clerical fascism that makes more visible this tension between nationalism, transnationalism, religion and politics, modernism and anti-modernism. So here I need to explain uh, very quickly the, the characteristics of the trend of integralist Catholics that I'm looking at. Um, so integralist Catholicism is the most traditionalist movement within the Catholic Church, the most reactionary. It opposes modernity in all its dimensions. Uh, in the, it rejects uh, rejected individualism, materialism, secularism, and liberalism. Um, so they embrace anti-modernism in every sense of the term. Um, not only the opposition to secular modern movements that were stigmatized by Pope Pius IX in his uh, syllabus in uh, um, 1864, but also the repression of Christian modernism within the church, so any, any form of reformism within the church, uh, which modernism within the church that was condemned by Pius X uh, in 1907, this uh, encyclical Pashendi. So the trend of integralist Catholicism originated in, during the French Revolution with the opposition to the French Revolution and then developed throughout the 19th century uh, and drew upon the political theology of neotomism, uh, which considered very quickly that the church was superior to the state, uh, that was above politics, and though um, integralists advocate not only for a complete restoration of the pop temporal power, but also for a right of the church to interfere, to intervene into public affairs. So therefore, integralist Catholics had a very ambivalent relation with politics, with modern politics. They claim to be independent, they claim to be above politics, um, because they consider that right and left were all modernized movement, they were all secularized, so they strongly rejected that. But that's the theory. In practice, uh, because they were counter-revolutionary and anti-liberal, they tend to 
uh, allied with right-wing uh, movements such as the Action Francaise, which I mentioned before, and of course, Italian fascism. So given their opposition to modernity, uh, integralist Catholics were also very anti-Semitic. Um, because liberal revolutions granted Jews civil rights and fostered Jewish emancipations, um, the figure of the Jews quickly crystallized the Catholic opposition to, moder to modernity, the Catholic resentment toward modernity. Uh, in some, they identify Jews with modernity. Um, and th their anti-Semitism relied on a form of paradox, which is that they use anti-Semitism against modernity, but they also use modern forms of anti-Semitism. So not only Christian theological anti-Judaism, but also modern forms of anti-Semitism, such as social, political, and even racial anti-Semitism. Um, and so that's the argument of the church Italian church historian Giovanni Micoli, we, uh, who mentioned uh, what he called a fluctuate, fluctuating interconnection, nesso fluctuant, um, between the tradition of Christian anti-Judaism and modern anti-Semitism. And so the milieu of clerical fascism during the interwar period are very specific, um, a keen example of this kind of interconnections. So in this presentation, I would like to stress three different aspects of the, the topic. First, the politicization of, of integralist Catholicism after the First World War. Second point, the internationalization of the network. And then third point, the institu institutionalization of clerical fascism uh, and anti-Semitism in the 1930s, and especially in 1938, when fascist Italy adopted anti-Semitic policies officially. Um, so first, um, the Bolshevik Revolution and the aftermath of the First World, War, First World War were a turning point for Catholic politics, uh, a moment of renewal of this counter-revolutionary tradition in France and Italy. So the trajectory of Monsignor Benigni, that you can see here on the left, uh, is emblematic of such mutation. Uh, he was an Italian priest and journalist, uh, then became a well-known professor of ecclesiastic history, at different Vatican universities. He was important under the pontificate of Pius X. And he was the leader of integralist Catholics uh, within the Vatican. After the war, however, he fell in disgrace and was disappointed by the democratization of Catholic politics. And he became more political and more um, right-wing. So then he founded this new network in 1920 called Intesa Romana di Difesa Socialis, Roman Intent of Social Defense. Um, and he even became an informer, a fascist informer for Mussolini regime, um, and notably for the political police, politiz, Polizia Politica. So integralist Catholics interpreted the Bolshevik Revolution, the, World War, the First World War, as a sign of providence, I mean, as, a, as God punishment against modern society for their rejection of God. And so they had a very apocalyptic and pessimistic vision uh, of the post-war era, a pessimism that was also shared by fascism at that time. So they consider that the post-war era was a cosmic struggle between the church and the anti-church, and that the restoration of Christianity and Christendom in Europe was the only uh, solution to the post-war crisis. That was uh, that what Monsignor Benigni said in 1923, and bear with me, I'll just cut the end of the quotation, where he said that the major practical duty of the good Catholics is to brandish the cross in the face of the de-Christianized Masonic and Judaized world. So in this per perspective, all means were good to re-Catholicize, to like make Catholic again, uh, European societies and politics, including the violence of fascism. So integralist Catholics use um, a sort of military terminology. They consider themselves as new crusader. They were called by the providence to become cut 
soldiers against the enemies of God. And they interpreted the dramatic changes following 1917, uh, 1918 through a conspirationist and anti-Semitic lens that rely on the myth of Judeo-Bolshevism, Judeo-Communism, and the idea of a world Jewish plot. So conspiracy theories, and especially the protocols of the elders of Zion, provided them with a very easy key of interpretation of all these dramatic changes happening after the war. Uh, so Monseigneur uh, Juan and Benigni were very convinced about the reality of this Jewish uh, plot against Christianity, and they produced an important amount of documents and material that could prove this conspiracy. So for instance, this uh, 1921 map that was showing the supposedly ramifications of the so-called Jewish bank from Milan. Uh, and so because of their also um, theological education and their ecclesiastic status, Monsignor Juan and Benigni considered themselves as historians and as scholars. And so they turned the, change, the exchange of this anti-Semitic propaganda in a sort of expertise, a sort of skill. So for instance, uh, Monsignor Juan wrote to Benigni in 1920, in such an interesting report that you sent me, uh, you wrote several times that there exists plenty of incont incontestable documents which prove the Jewish campaign for the universal domination of the world. Would you mind indicating me some of these documents and materials from which I can draw the evidence so necessary to my work? So this is from the Vatican Archive, some of the Benini papers. I also kept the quotations in their original language, so it's maybe easier than uh, English. <clears throat> so as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, Benini and Juan were the first translators of the protocols in France and Italy. First, uh, Monsignor Juan, so that's his uh, edition, uh, he translated them from German. So from the Russian version, they were translated in German and then from German to French. Um, Monseigneur Juin, what at, that, at that time was the priest of the parish of Saint Augustin in Paris, which is one of the most uh, wealth, wealthy and very conservative parish in, in Paris. And he published the protocols in five different volumes. And also in his uh, journal that was called the Revue Internationale des Sociétés Secrètes. So it's important to notice that Monseigneur Juin's version of the protocols became the most widely disseminated version in the Spanish-speaking world. The first Spanish version was published in Spain in 1927, and then again during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, but there were also versions that um, circulated in Colombia, in Argentina. So this one is the version from Argentina in 1931. And I think the success of this uh, diffusion of Monsignor Juan version could be explained because of his ecclesiastical status. He had a good reputation within the church because he was fighting for the rights of the church, notably in France, notably in the question of schools and education, Catholic education. He was also recognized by uh, the Pope, uh, the popes, and he received different titles, such as um, he was made pre prelate of His Holiness in 1918 and then became proto-notary apostolic uh, in 1924, and he even strategically used this uh, Vatican support in, oh, that doesn't work actually, in his publication of the, the protocols. You didn't see him, but he published one of the letters of support that he received from the Vatican in, in this version of the protocols. So following Juin, Monseigneur Juin, uh, Monseigneur Benigni, sorry, translated the protocols from the French into, the, into Italian at the beginning of 1921. And this translation was published in Fede Ragione, where a Catholic monthly edited in the Diocese of Fiesole, which is in, close to Florence in Tuscany. Uh, a Catholic publication which received the support of the local bishop, but also of Cardinal um, Tommaso Poggiani, who was a leading figure of the Integralist group and was uh, notably a consultor of the Holy Office within the Vatican. So it's through this first diffusion of the protocols that clerics, Catholics like Juan and Benigni, came in contact with right-wing nationalist 
activists that paved then the way to the formation of this anti-Semitic uh, international during the 1920s, which bring me to the second point uh, about this internationalization of uh, anti-Semitism and clerical fascism. So as the Vatican began to um, support um, democratic Catholic politics, Integralist Catholics instead became more involved into anti-democratic reactionary movements and politics, and they were looking for alliances outside of the church with right-wing secular nationalistic movements. Um, and this politicization happened not only at a national level, but also at a transnational level. Um, so Benini created this, I mentioned this first uh, network, the, this new network, the Intesa Romana di Difesa Sociale. And this network was active between different countries, Switzerland, Great Britain, Romania, Hungary, Ireland, Spain, Germany, Austria, Egypt, Canada, and the United States. And to mention only of the few collaborators of this network, they were all active in the diffusion of the protocols. Uh, quite small. In Germany, they were in contact with the first German translator of the protocols, Ludwig Müller, in uh, Berlin. In Austria, they were active with uh, Georges de Potter, which is important because he became, when after, after Hitler came to power in Germany, he founded the World Service, the Weltdienst, in Erfurt in uh, 1933, which was a Nazi news agency uh, that play a key role in the diffusion of anti-Semitism outside of Nazi Germany. And in, in England, um, in England, um, in England, um, there were um, close to right-wing, yeah, skip us. <laughs> they were active also with right-wing political movements called the Britons, and uh, led by Henry, Henry Bemish. So the Britons um, advocate for a new expulsion of Jews from England and a deportation to Madagascar. Their anti-Semitism mixed a rhetoric of Christian defense with a specific British imperialist and racist perspective. So for instance, Bemish uh, wrote to Monseigneur Juin in 1923, I I realize only too well that the whole of our civilization is built up on Christianity and that if the cross is trailing to the, in the mud, that all the right races will come down with it. And he also um, added that right-wing movements should have the courage to name their common enemy, the Jew. Um, I'm sorry, that's the same question again. Um, I am not definitely naming the alien instead of using such childish words as international financer of cosmopolitan alien. The fact is, of course, that people tremble at using the word Jew, but I intend to try and instill into the public sufficient courage to name the enemy. So this is interesting because this kind of populist rhetoric that claim to speak the truth of the people, the language of, the spe of people, is a long-term characteristic of fascism. Um, and finally, the network was... Um, anyway, they were in... Um, yeah, that's this one, but it doesn't... Well, it's fine. Um, so they were also in close contact with transatlantic networks of right, white Russian émigré. So white Russian émigré were the opponent, opponents of the Bolshevik revolutions from different political... Um, yeah, it doesn't want to show this one. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> so they were active with right, right Russian activists in, um, in the UK, in the United States, in... Um, in Italy, and notably with uh, one Russian called Tade de Vilchinsky, who was the official representative in London of the Grand Duke Kirill Vladimirovich, who was the pretender to the throne for the Romanov uh, house. 
and who came into contact with uh, Henry Ford. So Henry Ford, the famous car industrialist from Detroit, was at that time very involved in anti-Semitic an anti mass campaign, and he published a global bestseller called The International Jew. I was supposed to explain all of these changes happening after the, the post-war period. So why white Russian emigre, Monsignor Joan and Benigni, contacted Henry Ford to seek for his collaboration. And they explained that the right-wing anti-Semitic international was crucial because precisely the enemy, the Jew, was global. So they wrote to him um, in 1921, only by creating one common anti-Jewish front, we can count on a real success. Acting alone, each by himself, we risk to be defeated by the united and well-organized enemy. We must not forget that one of the chief tasks and aims of the Jews is to cause dissension among the Christian community. So it's sort of ironic that in order to fight what they consider internationalism, they precisely created an international. So between, 19, okay, between 1923 and 1926, this network organized different international anti-Semitic conferences in Rome, in Paris, in Salzburg, in Budapest. And um, they had minim a political program that was founded on what they called the three fundamental principles of Christian historic civilization, religion, motherland, and family. Religion, la patrie, la famille. And, and they were fighting what they considered being the common enemy of these values, uh, the Jews. So this program was broad enough to attract all these right-wing activists who were quite different between each other. Clearly, they were divergent on many aspects. They were integralists, French and Italian Catholics, Protestant, white supremacists in England and in the US, Russian Orthodox monarchists, and then neo-pagan and pan-German Nazi activists. So obviously these groups were very clearly different between them, but anti-Semitism provided them the common vocabulary and the common cause that they could fight for. And that's uh, what uh, Benini said explicitly in a letter to a French right-wing activist, Jean Drault, very famous anti-Semitic uh, publisher at the time, he said that on the anti-Semitic field, we can get along and agree with the other. So le terrain anti-Semitique, on peut s'entendre avec des tiers. So clearly, anti-Semitism was a sort of expertise that um, bring all these different groups together. Um, and it's quite explicit in what Monseigneur Juin wrote about the general er Eric Luderndorf, who was a pro-Nazi, pan-Germanist, Volkish uh, activist, and so he wrote about him, he said, Ludendorff is an imperialist, a dangerous enemy for our country, France. Nevertheless, his feelings towards France do not reduce to nothing his competence about Israel. He had perfectly shown where the common enemy of Europe and civilization was. That is actually the only point on which we can agree. So obviously this kind of difference brought different tensions, different um, dysfunctions, and that explained clearly the limitations of right-wing and international, also more generally, actually. Um, but however, despite this different divergence, this, uh, the first attempts of international uh, fascist, anti-Semitic international in the 1920s then had a legacy in the 1930s, most of these actors were still active in the 1930s, George de Potter or Henry Bemish, and they continued the project of international. At the same time, clerical fascism found institutional voice, for instance, in Italy, and that brings me to my last point, uh, about the, the legacy of transnational uh, clerical fascism during the 1930s. And it's important to... Um, say right, right away that in fascist Italy, the merging between fascism, the convergence between fascism and Catholicism was not inevitable, was not predictable, uh, because it relied more on strategical and opportunistic reasons than on ideological reasons. Uh, in fact, integralist Catholics were initially very skeptical and even sometimes um, oppose Italian fascism because Italian fascism, Mussolini party, 
was born as an anti-clerical, anti-establishment uh, movement, as a kind of revolutionary movement initially, and had a strong nationalistic claim on the Roman question. So the Roman question is the status of Rome after uh, 1870, when the Pope lose, uh, lost his um, temporal power. So, um, and also integralist Catholics look with suspicion the fascist political religion and his kind of totalitarian uh, claims. But then the fascist party turned to be more conservative and tried to, Mussolini tried to seduce the military, the industrial and the clerical elites of the country. And so the support of the church for the new regime focuses mainly, focused mainly on these reactionary uh, features of fascism, which are the repression of social movements, the conservative agrarian and demographic politics, the idea of the Christian family, corporate, corporatism, and of course, the reintegration of Catholicism into Italian public life, and especially into Italian education. So for instance, in 1923, a decree um, said that it was ob obligatory to place a crucifix in every class classroom, in every public school in Italy, which was not the case before. So as, as the regime turned out to be clearly a dictatorship in 1925, integralist Catholics participated in the first political formation of clerical fascism, which was called, oh, which was called um, the Centro Nazionale, the National Center. So it was a Catholic movement advocating for this collaboration between Catholicism and fascism. And, um, the Benini journal that I mentioned before, Fede Rajon, was actually quite active in this movement, and especially the, the owner of the journal, Fede Rajon, the Count, Count Filippo Sassoli de Bianchi, which you can see here on the speaking, um, was quite an important um, lay figure of Italian Catholicism. So the, the and that's, uh, that's him, and that's the, the editor of the, the journal, Fede Rajon. So the signature of the Lateran agreements in February 1929, between here you can see Mussolini and the Vatican Secretary of State, Gaspari. Uh, so the Lateran agreements was clearly a turning point that um, fostered the church support for Italian fascism because it recognized the official status as a, of the Vatican as a state and it proclaimed Catholicism as the unique state religion in Italy. And so it's interesting to see how the rhetoric of Integralist Catholic changed after 1929, and they start to praise Mussolini for being this providential man. Um, and here, this kind of rhetoric is kind of interesting to see also its legacy. So they wrote about Mussolini in 1929 that he was the new man called and elevated by our Lord for the salvation of Italy at the darkest time probably of its history. Mussolini, who knew which evil forces were oppressing her motherland, immediately called her back to its tradition. And Italy, shaken by the voice of the man who called her, did raise and obey. There's also a gender dimension clearly. Um, in this uh, quotation. So the integralist Catholics perceive Mussolini and fascism as an instrument that could crush the common enemies of both fascism and the Catholic Church, socialists, liberals, uh, Christian Democrats, Protestants, but also Jews. And um, clerical fascism play indeed a key role in the diffusion of anti-Semitic propaganda in fascist Italy. Um, Something important to notice is that they were advocating for a Catholic Latin version of anti-Semitism that could be different from Nazi Germany um, because Nazi, Nazi anti-Semitism was considered as anti-Catholic. So they claimed that they were advocating for the specific Christian Latin version of anti-Semitism that was supposed to be more human, more civilized. Uh, so when we talk about clerical fascism and anti-Semitism in fascist Italy, we should actually distinguish two different uh, phenomena. Uh, one is Catholics who volunt willingly contribute to, the, uh, to fascist anti-Semitic propaganda. And one other aspect of it is the fascist instrumentalization of Christian anti-Judaism. 
And here you can see an example in La Difesa de la Razza, where the official fascist, racist, anti-Semitic magazine. And they drew on like blood libel, see on like theological arguments such as the one of uh, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and another example of this is uh, Roberto Farinacci who was a, a fascist leader, was actually anti-clerical, anti-Catholic. But he said that, um, he argued that the anti-Jewish laws in fascist Italy were completely uh, modeled after uh, the church uh, provisions against Jews uh, during the Middle Ages and the modern period. So he said that as Catholic fascists, we consider the Jewish question a strictly political problem and not a religious issue. But to comfort our souls, we have to say that if as Catholics we became anti-Semites, we all need to the teaching provided by the church for 20 centuries. So they were clearly a form of instrumentalization of the church on record of anti-Semitism in order to prove that fascist Italy was in line, was in the tradition, in the continuity of church anti-Semitism. So there are many examples of this kind of propaganda, but I would like to sort of uh, close on one example that shows the legacy of the Benini Juan network that I presented before and the transnational dimension of anti Semitism and clerical fascism. And this example is um, Hermann de Fries de Kellingen, <coughs> who is uh, a Dutch member of the Dominican Third Order, so the lay se se section of the Dominican. He was a professor at the University of Nimegen. And he became, at the end of the 1920s, a very internationally recognized fascist uh, propagandist um, in France, Switzerland, Germany, and Italy. He was a supporter of uh, Italian fascism. He published in 1927 a book that was praising uh, fascism. And the book was translated in different languages, in English, in French. And he also founded in Switzerland, in Lausanne at that time, an international center for the study of fascism. And the center received the financial support of Mussolini. So he was traveling frequently between Switzerland, France, and Italy. And he became, in, in Paris, he became a um, uh, close collaborator of Monseigneur Juin, journal that I mentioned before, Revue Internationale des Sociétés Secrètes. And he published in French uh, different anti-Semitic books that had actually a lot of success. And these different books were translated in many different languages, including Italian, English, Polish, German, Swedish, Spanish. I don't know of any Portuguese versions, but that would be something interesting to look at. And these books received the support, good, good reviews from church publication, publications, such as La Civiltà Cattolica, which the, the Jesuit Journal of the Vatican but also from La Difesa della Razza, which I mentioned before as being this fascist uh, racist magazine. Uh, here you can see an article from November 1939 who praised him as one of the great international thinkers of racism and anti-Semitism. Here you can see an image when he looked like a professor. He has this image of he's respectable. He's like this very bourgeois type of um, propagandist, very like expert and scholar of anti-Semitism. Um, so because he has this position of intermediary between fascism and the church, um, fascist officials considered that he was actually helpful to use its, uh, prop his propaganda. Um, so the, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs believed that his book, Juif et Catholique, Jews and Catholics, could be useful for fascist propaganda. As they say as in a report to Mussolini, the very interesting thesis defended by the author with a rich documentation shows that the church, even though claiming to oppose persecutions, has always felt the need to keep the Jews in a subordinated position and far from power. This is the policy that all nations should adopt to curb the Semitic problem. This book, interesting for the documentation, for the bibliography, is an efficient element for the anti-Semitic propaganda and for racist studies, and in fact, Hermann de Vries de Kellingen then became, uh, was commissioned to publish a s small booklet in uh, 1940, um, L'Antisemitismo Italiano, that uh, was actually um, propagated abroad. So the, 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 the goal of this publication was to show 
outside of Italy to show that the anti-Semitic laws were legitimate. And they were legitimate because they were based on church tradition. So the book was uh, distributed in England, in France, in Japan, in Switzerland, and in Germany. And it argued for a strict separation between Jews and Christians, saying that the directive principles of the church since the fifth century have been renewed in the recent fascist laws. The church has always forbidden marriages between Jews and Catholics. The Italian law forbids marriages between Jews and Italians. So in this way, there are no legitimacy, for instance, for the Pope to uh, blame Mussolini for the anti-Semitic uh, laws. And I'm going to close on that. Uh, this kind of, oh, no, actually, that's a new edition of this book. And this new edition in English of this book by Armand de Vrede Kellingen was released in 2004 in London by right wing publisher called The Final Conflict. And so this kind of uh, rhetoric persisted during the war in fascist Italy. For instance, in uh, Guido Aureli, who was actually a friend of Benini and who was one of the last representatives of this generation of integralist Catholics. And he published in June 1941, so in, in the context of World War II, he published this anti-Semitic and anti-British pamphlet called Bombardiamo San Pietro. Um, so the graphic cover of the book represented three bombs dropped on St. Peter uh, Square, and each bomb with one word, first is Anglicanism, Ju um, Judaism, and three uh, masonries. Uh, and so according to Aureli, these were the three forces that were fighting against Catholic and fascist Rome. And he said that he wrote the, the book actually as a... Um, um, as part of the Christian war that Mussolini and Hitler were fighting against uh, world Jewry. So as he put, the, the book was written in the ardor and the palpitations of the very Christian war that we are fighting against Judaism. So in 1941. So that brings me to my conclusion, <clears throat> which is to... Um, that looking closely at this kind of propaganda... Uh, shows that there was clearly a trend of Christian, fascist anti-Semitism that often tried to show that it was different from Nazi anti-Semitism and it was in a way more legitimate. And, um, and this, kind of, this trend of propaganda remained completely unchallenged and unaddressed by the Catholic Church as well as in public memory. So there is a kind of amnesia about this kind of um, propaganda. And that may explain why it uh, continued to circulate it after World War II and after the Holocaust. So to come back to my very first example about the circulation of Monseigneur Juin versions of the protocols, um, he was reprinted again in Latin America during the Cold War. So in Mexico uh, in the 50s, in Chile in the, also in the 50s, in Argentina in the 70s, and the last version that I found was actually printed in Colombia, and that's the version that you can see now that is from 2004. Um, so showing again the long-term uh, legacy of this kind of propaganda, but also the transnational circulation of this type of propaganda. Thank you very much. Alô, agora sim. Eu queria agradecer a Nina. Depois, para quem quiser, ela vai estar vendendo os livros aqui fora. É brincadeira. Agora a gente vai ter aqui os comentários, a discussão com o professor Marcos Napolitano. Oh, voilà, si. Je voudrais me remercier votre conférence et je veux, je veux faire mon commentaire en portugais et d'après 
je, je vais poser quelques questions en anglais <rire> avec l'aide de, de Daniel et quelques trois, quatre, quatre questions. D'abord, je veux je vais faire quelques commentaires en portugais pour le public. Okay. Bon, euh, euh, antes, antes de, de, de colocar as questões para a professora Nina, eu uh, queria só uh, chamar a atenção para alguns aspectos uh, historiográficos do texto né, que ela apresentou, da conferência que ela apresentou. Uh, primeiro, é um dado de originalidade na pesquisa, que é pensar as redes, como ela mesmo já anunciou na, na, na conferência, as redes internacionais da extrema-direita, particularmente do, da, da extrema-direita fascista. Né? Durante o período clássico, aí, vamos dizer, do fascismo, entre os anos 20 e 40. Né? É, esse é um, um, um aspecto importante, porque, normalmente, nas ciências humanas, nós estudamos o internacionalismo da esquerda. Então, acho que é um ponto importante é, da, 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 enfim, da, da reflexão historiográfica. Né? Até porque, normalmente, o fascismo é pensado como um tipo de ideologia xenófoba e nacionalista. E, efetivamente, o é. Mas isso não impede de ter é, redes internacionais bastante sofisticadas. Né? E, e aqui, neste caso é, do, do tema apresentado na conferência, é, contou com o apoio da maior multinacional de todos os tempos, que é a Igreja Católica. Né? Uma multinacional que está muito bem aí há dois mil anos. Né? E, é, é claro, é, muito dividida internamente né? e Uh, e nem sempre o que os católicos, uh, sejam os clérigos, seja o laicato, uh, uh, falam né, em nome, supostamente, do catolicismo, é chancelado pela instituição igreja católica. É preciso que a gente tenha esse cuidado. Né? E o texto também da, da Nina mostra isto. Né? Que muitas vezes a fala de alguns clérigos nem sempre foi chancelada pela alta política da igreja e ou mesmo pela política específica do Vaticano pensado aí como um Estado, né? Esse é um ponto. Segundo, é, acho que um outro ponto importante é o papel do imaginário, né, na construção do antissemitismo, né? Os protocolos do sábio do Sião, é, talvez aí a, a fake news mais é, eficaz né, e longa de toda a história né, contemporânea, né? E, e nós estamos em um tempo de fake news, aliás, fazendo muitos estragos na nossa eleição brasileira deste momento. Né? É, portanto, é, é, é muito importante que a gente pense a dimensão propriamente imaginária, né? a dimensão é, que, se, que, inclusive, que, que torna a, a discussão verdadeira ou falsa um tanto quanto inútil, né? no certo sentido, posto que é uma fábrica de imaginários né? que alimenta preconceitos para os quais muitas pessoas, milhões de pessoas, estão dispostas a aceitar. Então, quem estuda o conceito de imaginário sabe que o imaginário só é eficaz quando ele encontra um meio social disposto a uh, incorporar enfim, seus, seus elementos. Né? E todo o material que a, a conferência da, da, da professora Nina nos, nos apresenta é, vive muito desta, dessa produção de um imaginário de um, de, um, de um baseado num, num, numa, é, numa numa produção de falsidades efetivas, né? tendo em vista a ideia do grande complô judaico capitalista bolchevique maçom, né? por aí você já imagina que é muita gente para uma né? para colocar numa mesma sala, né? <risos> uh... Então, esse é um ponto importante do texto, é, quer dizer, o papel do imaginário, imaginário chancelado, neste caso, por intelectuais. Acho que esse é um ponto importante. Todos esses, esses nomes citados aqui na conferência são intelectuais. Aí, é claro que eu estou trabalhando com um conceito muito amplo de intelectuais, mas são, portanto, pessoas que pertencem a uma elite letrada católica, da, da Igreja Católica ou da Universidade, né, que produzem né? É, textos 
calcados em falsidades, em preconceitos, em, é, em mentiras, que tem, mas de todo modo se apresentam com uma pretensão de legitimidade intelectual. Acho que esse é um ponto importante também. Né? É, esse é um pouco diferente, talvez, do contexto atual, né? embora daqui a alguns anos eu já não sei o que vai acontecer, mas, é, pelo menos no contexto atual, esse é um, um dado interessante, porque as fake news geralmente carecem de legitimidade intelectual. Né? E aqui não. Aqui nós estamos num momento em que, efetivamente, né, é, é, uma, uma certa elite intelectual, repito, estou usando um conceito de maneira muito ampla, né, produz esses, esses materiais. É, então, esse é um ponto muito importante da, da, da pesquisa, que eu gostaria de, de destacar também. Quer dizer, o fato de intelectuais adeptos do fascismo, no caso aqui o fascismo clerical, produzirem né, reflexão, né, supostamente enfim, ancorada ou na doutrina ou na ciência, dentro do que se entendia por ciência, aí, obviamente, no sé nos anos 30 do século XX, né, a ciência da raça, né, é, e, é, na verdade, para disseminar, um para reforçar e disseminar um preconceito que era milenar. Né, no caso aí, especificamente, o antissemitismo. Veja, então, é, é, e é interessante porque o antissemitismo é um preconceito que é anterior à cientificização do preconceito racial que vem no final do século XIX. Que aí vai, é, é, vai ter como alvo não apenas né, a questão judaica, como se dizia, mas também todos os chamados povos atrasados, povos bárbaros né, do, do mundo. Né. Mas é interessante que o antissemitismo já era um preconceito ancorado né, em várias... É, em várias tradições, religiosas ou não, desde aí, a Idade Média, pelo menos, né? pelo menos, para não falar antes. É... E que, é, que passa por um processo de legitimação científica e intelectual no final do século XIX. Essa talvez seja a grande, a grande questão. É... Que, que... A grande novidade né? que vai, inclusive, depois... É transformar este preconceito milenário em uma política de Estado genocida, no caso especificamente da Alemanha. Uh, falando um pouquinho do caso brasileiro, eu, quando li o texto uh, da professora Nina, eu lembrei muito do, 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 do fascismo aqui no Brasil, na mesma época. Né? Havia um movimento forte, né? que se chamava exatamente integralismo, né? Uh, Embora o conceito aqui de integralismo do texto seja diferente do, do, que, do que no Brasil chamou-se integralismo, né? ah, embora o nosso integralismo, nosso nossa ação integralista brasileira, né? ela, é, em princípio, ad, 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 incorporava elementos do catolicismo tradicional. Mas esse era apenas um dos elementos que formavam o integralismo. Né? É, o Plínio Salgado, por exemplo, adorava distribuir bíblias autografadas por ele mesmo. É, nos, seus, nos seus encontros né, com, com seus correligionários. Né? Então é interessante isso. Né? Há os biógrafos do Plínio Salgado, inclusive, é, apontam um dado né, interessante, que é o fato de, do Plínio Salgado nunca efetivamente ter abandonado completamente nem o liberalismo elitista e oligárquico brasileiro, né, nem o catolicismo tradicional, o que prejudicou, sem dúvida, a sua liderança como um fascista. Estou né, um, pensando aqui no, no Fábio Bertonha, por exemplo, né, na sua biografia do Fábio Bertonha sobre o Salgado, em que ele aponta né, o quanto a, o elemento católico era importante neste, neste movimento. Por outro lado, vale lembrar que a Igreja Católica no Brasil, uh, que tem um papel político muito importante desde a ascensão de Dom Sebastião Leme, em 1916, no arcebispado enfim, brasileiro, uh, ela nunca endossou completamente o fascismo, pelo menos o fascismo enquanto movimento específico da extrema-direita. Né? Embora muitos católicos aderiram, tenham aderido ao integralismo, sobretudo ao integralismo. Né? É, a Igreja Católica, no Brasil, tinha um projeto próprio, um projeto que pode ser classificado dentro dos chamados corporativismos, que, aliás, é uma questão que eu vou colocar para a Nina, porque o texto dela 
no fundo, tangencia um debate que é histórico, né, para quem estuda o fascismo, que é o conceito de fascismo genérico. Né? Ela apresenta aqui um conceito específico, que é o fascismo clerical, mas é inevitável que a gente pense num debate, que a gente retome um debate, né, que vem lá dos anos 90, 80, pelo menos, que é o conceito de fascismo genérico, que enfim, tem passado por uma revisão muito forte. Né? Muitos autores preferem usar o termo corporativismos e não fascismo. Fascismo seria uma espécie de corporativismo. Né? Então, de todo modo, é interessante que a Igreja Católica no Brasil tinha um projeto político que não pode ser, talvez, considerado fascista, embora fosse corporativista, fosse, enfim, respondesse a algum tipo de integrismo católico. Por exemplo, é interessante que a Igreja organizou um grande, um grande movimento de intelectuais laicos né, em torno das suas doutrinas para defender, por exemplo, muito mais a partir de uma agenda negativa e não de, propriamente uma doutrina positiva, certos, certos princípios de organização do Estado e da sociedade, principalmente em torno da, ao longo dos anos 30, quando Getúlio Vargas esteve no poder no Brasil. Aliás, é interessante porque o Getúlio Vargas, que muitos autores consideram um proto-fascista, na verdade, sofreu um grande, uma grande desconfiança por parte da Igreja Católica, porque ele era visto como agnóstico. Então, é interessante que também... E vejam, o Getúlio Vargas era um defensor do corporativismo como modelo de organização social, mas passava muito longe, por exemplo, do fascismo clerical ou das bases da Igreja Católica. A Igreja Católica, inclusive, tinha uma preocupação muito grande com, com Vargas e seus principais assessores, porque é, viam em Vargas, ou mesmo em, em grande parte do exército brasileiro, que era um fiador político importante do projeto autoritário, dos anos 30, é, muito mais uma tradição positivista, portanto moderna, do que propriamente tradicionalista e católica. Lutero, exatamente, já começava por aí. É, mas, obviamente, Vargas era um pragmático e se aproximou da Igreja Católica. Né? E, inclusive, durante o seu primeiro ano do seu governo, não foi ele que propôs a construção, mas no primeiro ano do seu governo, inaugurou-se a famosa estátua do Cristo Redentor, no Rio de Janeiro, né? que é uma estátua que hoje virou muito mais uma atração turística, mas que tem o objetivo de uh, consolidar no imaginário popular a ideia do Brasil atavicamente católico. Cristão, mas, sobretudo, católico. Perdão. Perdão. É... Então, esse é um dado interessante que eu uh, queria chamar a atenção. Né? O, uh... As relações tensas entre fascistas, vamos dizer assim, integralistas, Igreja Católica e o Estado Corporativo Brasileiro, Corporativista Brasileiro, inaugurado por Getúlio Vargas, comandado por Getúlio Vargas, né, sobretudo a partir de 1937, né, quando se explicita a ditadura vargista. Mas o projeto autoritário é bem anterior a 1937. Né. É... Dentro do integralismo no Brasil, Gustavo Barroso era efetivamente aquele que defendia o lugar central do antissemitismo. Isso é interessante. Né? Gustavo Barroso talvez seja o um intelectual. Aliás, um intelectual muito reconhecido. Né? É... Inclusive que sobreviveu a todos os regimes políticos que vocês possam imaginar. Né? Ele foi diretor, por exemplo, do Museu Histórico Nacional dos anos 20 aos anos quase os anos 60. Né? E nunca renegou o seu viés, enfim ultraconservador e fascista. Ele, dentro do integralismo, Gustavo Barroso era aquele que defendia que o antissemitismo deveria ser o elemento central de uma política não é, integralista. Plínio Salgado não tanto, Miguel Reale não tanto, para a gente ficar nos três grandes intelectuais do integralismo. Então é interessante também como entre esses intelectuais havia uh, também, uh, vamos dizer assim, ponderações acerca do antissemitismo. Quer dizer, é... Por outro lado, 
né? um, um, um elemento muito interessante para a gente pensar, sobretudo em relação ao antissemitismo no Brasil, é como aponta o livro da professora Maria Luísa Tutti Carneiro, né? é que o antissemitismo se tornou uma política oficial do Estado brasileiro nos anos 30. Né? Por exemplo, o, havia uma série de dificuldades para que judeus tivessem carreira militar na alta oficialidade do Exército Brasileiro. Né? Por exemplo, é, havia uma grande dificuldade para a entrada de emigrados judeus nos anos 30 e 40. Aliás, Vargas, nesse, nesse sentido, ele era muito hábil né? e procurava trazer grandes intelectuais judeus né? perseguidos pelo nazismo, ao mesmo tempo que fechava as portas para a imigração de massa daqueles que fugiam das perseguições. Né? Caso, tô lembrando o caso do Stefan Zweig, né? que é, viveu no Brasil, foi recebido pelo, 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 pelo centro do poder, né? mas Vargas o tempo todo enfim, mantinha numa posição de suspense em relação a uma grande política de apoio aqueles aquelas pessoas vamos dizer assim entre aspas comuns que fugiam do nazismo né? é, a, o, o biógrafo de Stefan Zweig Alberto Dines inclusive suspeita que essa teria o suicídio de, de Stefan Zweig no Brasil teria sido uma espécie de protesto né? exatamente por conta desse não lugar né? de uma política de acolhida para os judeus que fugiam né? E ele se sentindo privilegiado aqui por estar abrigado, quase que um convidado oficial do governo brasileiro, vamos dizer assim, teria, come, teria enfim, cometido suicídio junto com sua esposa como uma forma de protesto, né? deixando várias cartas, várias, várias pistas de que realmente ele se, se, se suicidava porque a, a sua principal tarefa, que era abrir as portas para uma imigração de massa, sobretudo no Brasil, que era visto como um país supostamente aberto, né? Uh, aos, aos estrangeiros, né? uh, um país tolerante em termos de religião, né? uh, ele não tinha conseguido efetivar essa política. Né? Então é interessante que, uh, a despeito da ausência de um discurso antissemita muito estruturado, no discurso oficial, na era Vargas, havia um forte antissemitismo como política de Estado. Uh, então acho que o trabalho... Uh, eu estou fazendo alguns comentários sobre o contexto brasileiro, porque, embora não esteja aqui no texto da professora Nina, a gente pode tecer vários diálogos com o fascismo e a extrema-direita no Brasil, e, sobretudo, em relação à questão do, do, do antissemitismo. Feito isso, eu queria fazer algumas questões. aí tentar fazer no meu inglês macarrônico. E aí, se não der, você me ajuda aqui. Não sei se a Nina está compreendendo alguma coisa. Eu vou acompanhar. Hum. I would like to, to put five, five questions. Um, first, uh, uh, it's a, a conceptual problem, I think. Or question, not problem, but question. Uh, the role of antisemitism in the Uh, transformation of the fascism in uh, a kind of political religion. I think the concept uh, uh, discussed by uh, the article of D Didier uh, Musidlac, published in the 20th century. I, I think uh, you don't use this concept, but in your text, have uh, some suggestions of uh, a kind of uh, link of fascism and religion. And why you don't use this, or excuse this problem, the fascism as political religion, is the first question, the methodological or theor theoretical question, I think. Uh, the second question, Uh, how we think the antisemitism as um, as a kind of uh, culture, popular culture, or diffused culture among the society, and antisemitism as politic of state. 
there, there's a, a relation, uh, a mechanical relation between between the the anti-Semitism as culture, as culture phenomena, and political uh, politic of state. Uh, I think, uh, obviously, in in a, an extreme uh, kind of political state, or the genocide. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I think in your text, this kind of anti-Semitism uh, is not automatically linked uh, or imply a uh, genocide politics. I think it's more uh, um, to maintain uh, the Jews are uh, as a, a subaltern people, subaltern group. Um, the third, third question is how we think the, your, uh, the concept in, in, in your text, uh, uh, clerical fascism, uh, inside the uh, great discussion about the uh, generic fascism. I think the, the, the text uh, I think from, from the text of uh, Enzo De Felice, mm. or um, uh, Emilio Gincili, or other authors that looking for a, 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 um, a mac macro uh, concept, concept of fascism. Okay. Uh, cl clerical fascism is a, a, a um, is is a sub concept of generic fascism or a specific concept of fascism? Okay. Uh, how do you think this this problem of, of the generic fascism? Okay. And uh, the the fourth question. Um, is a question uh, about memory, about the, a kind of um, memory operation or uh, memory operation that um, I forgot the word. Obliterate, thank you. That obliterated um, the anti Semitism and genocide and Holocaust to the Catholic tradition. Because I think in the public memory, the genocide, the Holocaust, uh, is linked much more to the Aryanism, to the eugenic eugenic principles, or even in uh, xenophobia, xenophobia, xenophobia. Okay. Because I think the, this contribution of Catholic tradition has obliterated from public memory. I think uh, after World War, the Catholics no, no. Okay. And your text is very important because you remember this long tradition, long term tradition of uh, anti Semitism, a Catholic anti Semitism. Okay. I think it's, it's all. And I like it too much. Thank you so much for your conference. Acho que a gente pode deixar a Nina responder essas perguntas e depois pegar as perguntas da plateia e aí eu vou traduzindo para quem precisar, tá bom? Ok? So, maybe you can answer those and then again those ones. Um, so, thank you so much for um, your question. Um, 
I hope that will make sense because I hear Portuguese, I write in, in French, and now <laughs> I have to answer in English. Uh, but that's very transnational, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and maybe I'm going to mix different questions together. Um, <clears throat> so the question of uh, fascism as a political religion is very important, and that kind of connected to the idea of generic fascism. So um, the Italian historian Emilio Gentile sp speaks about fascism as being this political religion. And that's very complex, actually, to integrate in my research because precisely this idea of fascism as being a new political religion was a source of tension between uh, the regime of Mussolini and the Catholic Church. And so, as I try to show a little bit also, so there was clearly a sort of competition between the fascist regime and the Catholic Church to who's going to have the cultural hegemony in, in fascist Italy. So, um, so that was creating a source of tension. And um, the movements of clerical fascism we're clearly uh, not looking at fascism as a form of political religion. So they are clearly, so basically it's interesting to look at clerical fascism as being more like a sub concept of fascism, but also as a trend within fascism, that trend that tried to push fascism to go in a certain way. That was a very counter-revolutionary way, very uh, right-wing, very traditionalist. Well, at the same time, within fascism, there were forces that were more revolutionary in the sense that society, they consider that society uh, needed to change completely. They wanted to create a new man. So there is a contradiction within Italian fascism and also uh, other forms of fascism, actually, between this, mod like what I say, modern and anti-modern. So there was one trend that is pushing toward this idea of a new man and that is very inclined toward modernity, using also sciences uh, and racism as a form of sciences to build this new man. And on the other hand, this more traditionalist trend that is more uh, Catholic. So the question of political religion is also related to fascism as a form of, as a totalitarian uh, regime. And so there is debate, a lot of debate in the scholarship about that, but Emilio Gentile, uh, thinks that fasc Italian fascism was the first totalitarian regime and had these totalitarian um, claims that the Pope, even the Pope at that time, Pius XI, actually addressed that. In 1931, he published an encyclical that was criticizing the fact that uh, the fascist regime was uh, interfering too much into Catholic organizations. And so there was this tension between Catholic organizations and especially for the youth, so um, and and for uh, children and then teenager or Catholic organization, and in in his uh, encyclical Non abbiamo bisogno, 1931, he said that the real totalitarian power is the church. <laughs> so there was this clearly this idea of competition between the church and the fascist regime for um, this idea of cultural hegemony. Um, and considering now the, more like the second aspect of anti-Semitism as popular culture. Ah, okay. Oui. Então, nessa primeira questão, se o fascismo é uma, é, como é que ela pensa o debate, o, o tema dela, né, que é o fascismo clerical dentro da discussão do fascismo como religião política, que é um, um conceito que surge no debate dos especialistas sobre fascismo, aí, uh, principalmente aí Emílio Gentili, né? é, a Nina aponta que, na verdade, é, é muito complicado é, associar fascismo à religião, porque, no caso especificamente do fascismo italiano, havia uma forte tensão com a Igreja. Embora houvesse pontos de colaboração, de, de conexão, havia, na verdade, uma forte tensão é, com a Igreja Católica. Né? que sempre teve, obviamente, uma preponderância na política italiana. Né? É, e, então, ela, ela, esse conceito deve ser visto com muito cuidado, porque é, os, os, 
as evidências apontam muito mais para uma tensão, para uma, uma certa competição a despeito dessa, 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 dessa partilha do antissemitismo. É, uh, o fascismo uh, ele tem um viés que é revolucionário, no sentido de querer criar uma nova sociedade, um novo homem, e exatamente o contrário, portanto, do, do, integ, do integrismo, integralismo, que eu vou usar a palavra original, mas aqui a gente chamaria de integrismo no Brasil, católico, que é exatamente a velha sociedade e... É, e, e, e é contra-revolucionário, fundamentalmente. Né? Uh, ok? Acho que eu, é mais ou menos esse o resumo, só para... Um, so then for the question of anti, the relation between antisemitism as culture and politics, and related also to the... to antisemitism that led to genocide. So, in my research, I have a kind of broad definition of antisemitism, so I don't consider that antisemitism can be reduced to something that is um, that leads to genocide that is necessarily about the extermination. Um, antisemitism is about uh, the hate of Jews and so it takes actually different forms and so in fascist Italy it's complicated because until 1943, until Nazi Germany invaded fascist Italy in 1943, um, there was no um, idea of genocide, but there was a strong uh, anti-Semitic persecution that had an impact on the life uh, of the Jewish community in Italy, not only the Italian Jewish community, but especially, uh, for instance, German Jewish refugees who were in fascist Italy, who thought that they were protected in fascist Italy until 38, when they had to, because of the anti-Semitic laws, they had to leave immediately the country. Um, so there, there was persecution and there was discrimination. There was no plan of extermination until 43. So that's a specificity of fascist Italy. But then, of course, this persecution put Jews in a situation of uh, complete um, being um, not as citizens anymore. That obviously then facilitated uh, their deportation. And, and Italian fascists after 43 participated in the deportation of Jews. But there was not the ideology of fascist antisemitism in fascist Italy was not necessarily uh, aimed at extermination, but at, at a form of subordination. So that's why here they clearly could meet with the church because they were, and that's what the propaganda was saying is that we don't do what they do in Nazi Germany. Uh, we are much more, we are much more Catholic and Latin and blah, blah, blah. And so we just want to put them outside of Christian society. We would clearly want this separation. And actually it's, and so some Catholic publication at that time uh, from the Vatican, La Civiltà Cattolica, which I mentioned, Jesuit uh, publication, was arguing for what they call um, la segregazione amichevole, so the, the, a friendly segre segregation. It's a friendly segregation between Jews and Catholics. So that's what they were arguing for. And so here there was clearly uh, a common ground between uh, fascism and, and, and the Catholic Church. And that brings me to the, actually I'm gonna answer the question about the memory at the same time because it's, it's actually connected. Because there is this idea, there was this idea that this form of antisemitism was not as strong as Nazi antisemitism and was not necessarily racial, which I actually disagree with. But um, because of that, the memory is, of this phenomenon is much more complicated. And it's related also to, uh, so for instance, uh, Hannah Arendt, when she published about the origins of totalitarianism, and antisemitism, she considered antisemitism as only a modern racial secular phenomenon. She doesn't look at fascist Italy at all. And so the historiography on fascist Italy and antisemitism is, was very conditioned by this model uh, like Arendt, uh, an Arendt influence actually on that. And so within the church, there was of course a complete um, uh, amnesia about this uh, phenomenon, and um, and I think it's actually important because I think this trend of clerical fascism and, anti and Catholic antisemitism before the war explained the first Catholic interpretations of the Holocaust after the war, and that's very important. So, for instance, in 45, 45 until the 50s, 
the interpretation, the Catholic Church interpretation of the Holocaust is that it's somehow related to theological arguments about uh, Jews being a people curse because of the day side. I don't know if you need to maybe translate the day side, like the, the idea, the myth that Jews had killed Christ and they were yeah. punished yeah. by God because of that. So in Catholic yeah. theology, there is this idea that Jews will suffer. They, they're meant, their, their fate is to suffer um, because there were the people that was first elected and then rejected by God and they even killed Christ. So, so this idea then in some Catholic publications and not minor but mainstream Catholic publication in 45, 48, you can find this idea that the Holocaust could be explained by this long history of um, Jewish suffering that it explained by the fact that they rejected Christ. So I think here there's much more studies to do about the, the memory in the first, very first interpretations of the Holocaust. Um, but just to close on that, there's one important Vatican document in um, 1998 by John Paul II. Um, we, 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 will rem re we remember, that's the title of the encyclical in, um, in English. So it's the, it's the encyclical that uh, recognized, I mean, it's not an encyclical, sorry, it's a statement, Vatican statement, that recognized the, the Shoah, the Holocaust, sorry, and recognized that some Catholics have uh, contributed to anti-Semitism. But the document clearly make a distinction between Christian anti-Judaism and modern anti-Semitism. And again, they said that modern anti-Semitism was not, was com something completely new. So there's a complete dichotomy between both phenomena. And what I wanted to actually to do is, is to show that these two concepts are actually completely, like the lines between both of them are very blurred and there's a porosity between both phenomena. Sorry, it's very long. <laughs> um, well, uh ela disse que, é, no caso específico, é, ela está mais preocupada com o antissemitismo mais amplo, né? é, e não necessariamente, não mecanicamente ligado à questão do genocídio, embora, obviamente, há um solo comum nessa, né, nessa, nesse tema. É, o... No caso específico do, no, do fascismo italiano, eu lembro que até 43, quer dizer, as, as leis antissemitas começam antes, em 38, né, mas a questão da deportação e efetivamente a contribuição para o genocídio se dá efetivamente em 1943 com a entrada do exército alemão na Itália, né, já no processo de praticamente guerra civil, né, é, que vai culminar na, na derrubada de Mussolini né, e na República de Saló depois. Né. É, então, é, o que, o que tudo indica que, é, que é, o, o foco desse antissemitismo específico clerical era muito mais manter as populações judaicas subordinadas né? é, e, e chegando, chegando a usar um termo um tanto quanto bizarro, né? eu diria, é um comentário meu, não dela, <risos> que é a segregação amigável, né? Enfim, que nós conhecemos bem no Brasil como é, né? aliás, com não só, não obviamente em relação aos judeus, mas né? em relação, por exemplo, aos afrodescendentes, né? segregação amigável. É, e que, aliás, é, vou fazer aqui um parênteses também, né? é tradução comentário. <risos> né? Vai lembrar o lugar que a Igreja Católica no Brasil teve em relação à escravidão, que também é outra amnese importante. Né? É, em relação à a, a questão da memória, é bem interessante porque é, é, depois... Há um, há um processo de esquecimento desse lugar da, do, da, do catolicismo, no antissemitismo, né? até em função do, do holocausto. Acho que a, a, a percepção e as narrativas sobre o holocausto vão mudar bastante. Uh, por um lado, né? o, a, vão, vão tornar desconfortáveis essas posições de, dos católicos, mas, ao mesmo tempo, há toda uma operação, uh, no, no imediato pós-guerra, entre 45 e 48, né? de explicar o sofrimento dos judeus por conta de ser o povo que matou né, é, Cristo, que, que, que rejeitou Cristo. Né? O povo inicialmente escolhido, mas que teria rejeitado Cristo. Então, os católicos, algumas publicações, vão é, explicar o, o Holocausto, 
uh, ainda em termos teológicos. Né? E, é, em 1998, né, num, é, num, numa, num discurso né, do, do Papa João Paulo II, né, se faz a referência ao antissemitismo, se reconhece a questão da Shoah, se, faz, se esboça uma, uma espécie de autocrítica, mas, nesse, nessa perspectiva, se separa claramente o que é o antijudaísmo católico do antissemitismo moderno, que seria o responsável pelo genocídio. Né? Então, é uma operação de memória bastante sofisticada e que vai, obviamente, atenuar o lugar do antissemitismo católico no, no Holocausto. Agora, acho que a gente podia fazer questões para a Roberta. Deixa eu ver meu então, horário. Vamos chamar aqui questões do público. Eu vou traduzindo de um lado para o outro. Dúvidas? Perguntas? Diga. Se você for fazer pergunta em inglês, eu vou pedir para você fazer aqui no microfone para gravar ali, porque depois você vai aparecer lá no YouTube. Vai mesmo. Okay, so I would like to ask about what happened to such members of the Catholic Church, such as the Integralists and the National Center, after the end of World War II and the fall of fascism? Quem mais? Aqui? Não? So, I, I have a question a little bit along those lines. Uh, we heard mostly about the cultural circulation of those networks. What about other kind of uh, connections? For instance, uh, some of those uh, Brazil integralists, they were exiled, and I would, would imagine that they would have received help elsewhere. And in this aftermath of, of the war, I would imagine that some people might have helped each other as well. So how, how did it work? Did they have this kind of uh, security networks or something, solidarity, something like that? Um, <clears throat> so for most of these um, integralist Catholics, actually most of them die <laughs> pretty quickly after the war or even before the war. So because they're part of this kind of older generation, um, That was even, they're mostly born around like uh, 1880 or 900. So um, the Dutch, for instance, propagandists that I show, uh, show that died in 41, uh, Benini died before. So it's kind of an older generation. Um, the one who did survive didn't have any trouble because uh, in fascist Italy, there was not such a. Depuração. Uh, like, Sim, <laughs> uh, Like there was in France, for instance, after the war, or in Nazi Germany. So most of the fascist um, officials and most of the propagandists did actually uh, continue. Guido Aureli still published this one, still published a book in 46, I think, about the, the church being Americanized. So now it's like the new. The, his new focus, and the Catholic Church is too American or something like that. Um, so, the, you know, they didn't have any form of trouble. The trend of integralism then actually found a form of renewal in uh, 1965. So that's the Second Vatican Council, which is very important within the Catholic Church for the modernization of the Catholic Church. And that's the first time that the Catholic Church recognized that there were other religions that could lead to salvation, basically. So it's the first ecumenical moment, a recognizement of, uh, acknowledgement of ecumenical um, uh, with, within the church, to say it very briefly. The integralists, obviously, they oppose that very strongly. So the, here there is a new trend of integralism that was born from the opposition to this modernization of the church and that was specifically also anti-Semitic. So here there's some, but I haven't worked some, I would like to work more on that. And also, um, to answer, should I answer everything? Yeah. Um, and so 
actually after the for the Brazilian integralists who went who were exiled, I actually don't know, but that would be an interesting question. But of course, these networks were also not only cultural, but were also network of support. So Benini that I show initially was had co because he was a fascist informer, he had close connection within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so he helped a lot of white Russians emigre to get visas to settle in Italy. And in Italy, they, could, they were mainly in Rome and in the south of Italy, um, because Puglia having this kind of orthodox church, the eastern part of Italy having this orthodox, uh, Christian orthodox legacy. Uh, so they settled there. And Guido Aureli, so this, this guy was in contact with them and this book is also the product of his connections with this white Russian emigre in in uh, in Italy. So there was also some sort of it's a network. It's also an, it's a network in different dimensions, and one of them is one of it's also a form of soci soci sociabilities and um, form of support like that. Muito bem, gente. A gente não precisa ficar com vergonha se tímido. A gente traduz. Pode perguntar em português. Não tem problema. Vocês querem que eu traduza aqui rapidamente o que ela disse? Ou todo mundo entendeu? <risos> Diga. O que você preferir? <risos> I like to ask, uh, because you mentioned how these various transnational fascist groups, they, and religious, uh, clerical fascism, uh, but you mentioned a bit about how there were also Protestant groups, mm -hmm. and I, I would just like to ask if you could maybe like uh, draw just a few examples or a few ways in which these also Protestant groups, uh, but were also fascist, how they relate in perhaps a bit, just a simple picture um, in the various places, or a few like, examples and ideas. Um. Hi, um, I'm starting to write a paper uh, about, well, it's basically the same, but in Brazil. Uh, it's a, I'm researching a newspaper, a Catholic newspaper in the 30s, where a lot of these uh, aspects come up. Mm -hmm. So I just, uh, they talk a lot about how, in, in relation to Nazi German, how Hitler was doing good because he was trying to protect the families. Uh, but, and they also talk about the Jewish problem, mm -hmm. but they see the Aaronism as a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very ambivalent, mm -hmm. and there's also a question about Hitler and the church, mm -hmm. uh, concordate, concordate. Mm -hmm. and it's very ambivalent. And I want to know if, uh, this could be an influence of all this, of this thought, or if this was a broader uh, view of the church. Mm -hmm. The newspaper is called A Cruz. It's from a par parochy, mm -hmm. a parochia mm -hmm. in Rio. Mais mm alguém? -hmm. Ali atrás? Quer vir de novo? Vocês atrás não querem perguntar? Não? Então. I know finding contradictions within the Catholic Church is not the hardest thing to do, <laughs> but uh, how could the church use such a concept like Christian war against Judaism? By, made by Germany and Italy if they had clear conflicts with the Italian fascists and went as far as seeing German fascists as anti-church. Okay. <clears throat> um, so these are interesting because they're somehow related also. 
with like Protestantis Protestantism and, and Nazi, Nazi Germany. So I will start by the, the Catholic newspaper in Rio. That's actually very interesting. That's not so surprising in terms of like the contradict the tensions that you mentioned that are kind of the same as I found in fascist Italy and even in France or in different countries. Um, so I would say that it's probably an influence of kind of this traditionalist thought within the church, neo-Thomist uh, influences. So the integralists are kind of the right-wing part of what we call more broadly the intransigent, in, um, Catholicism intransigent, for instance, in France. Um, so they are at the right-wing part of this broader um, force within the church that was the, basically until the 50s is the main stream interpretation because it's related to the relation of the church with modernity, which is basically a rejection until, until the Second Vatican Council, almost. So I would say it's, um, so it could be both. It could be both of these broader tendencies and then more, maybe more specifically, something that is also connected to this integralist uh, trends. And, and the relation with Nazi Germany, so it's actually complex also within Nazi, Nazi Germany because within, and within Nazism, there are trends of Nazism that are clearly neo-pagan, um, anti-church and anti-Catholic clearly. Then there are the Protestants who also try to do a kind of national, nationalist church um, in Germany. And then the Catholics, uh, some Catholics would, did try to find a common ground with Nazi Germany, including in the Vatican. So the Secretary, Secret, Secretary of State in 1933, uh, during the time of the Concordat between Nazi Germany and the Church, was Eugenio Pacelli, who then became the Pope during the Second World War, Pius XII. So Pius XII, during the Holocaust, uh, it's a con Controversial pop, obviously, for the, for, well, I won't enter into too much detail into that, but he's the one who signed the Concordat with Nazi Germany. And why? Because he was very pragmatical and very, and diplomacy was the most important for him. So he was like, okay, Nazi, I mean, Nazi ideology is clearly not compatible with Catholicism, but we have to defend the right of the Catholic Church in Germany. So that's why they signed the Concordat. And then there's a little bit of ideological convergence, which is anti-communism. So they saw, they saw Nazi Germany as being this, this um, form of defense against communism. And for some of them within the church, that also goes with the idea of Judeo-communism. But not, not all, of course, the Vatican was like that, but clearly anti-communism was an official policy of the Catholic Church at this point, that's very clear. Um, and so for Protestants, well, I, so I answered a little bit about Nazi Germany, but then what I wanted to show is actually this network was kind of informal and was composed of different groups. So there was the Catholic Integralist and they did exchange all of this propaganda and they did meet in conferences with Protestants from, the, so from Great Britain, from the US, uh, like Henry Ford, from Germany, and also with Christian Orthodox from Russia, obviously. And the Christian Orthodox, the, uh, Christian Orthodox were, were the most problematic for them um, because of the status of the Catholic Church in Russia was very bad before the Bolshevik Revolution. So they were looking with suspicion at right Russian immigrants saying that you want to bring back the Orthodox Church in Russia. So there were some tensions like that. So what I was trying to show is this tension. In terms of anti-Semitism, um, the Protestant trend of anti-Semitism tended to be more modern because there's not the same from the Protestant churches and that's a very complex world. <laughs> There's less uh, hostility toward modernity, and there's less hostility toward nationalism also. So uh, to say it very, it's a very stereotypical division, but within the Catholic Church, antisemitism was mainly anti-liberal and anti-modern and very conspirationist. Within Protestant Church, it's more, it's more national and it's uh, more secularized in a way. And just to end on the last question, the contradiction, 
Uh, how can they say this is a Christian war, but also Nazi Germany is anti-Catholic? So this is related also to the context, which is different. So 41 is the... So this is war, this is fascist war propaganda against, uh, against Great Britain and showing that Great Britain is like Judaized, Masonized. Um, so there is this aspect that can explain why he can say something so obviously doesn't make any sense. Um, but then there is also who are we looking at? So this is Guido Aureli is a lay man. He is a Catholic, so um, and he's a journalist that was specialized in Vatican ish Vatican um, reports from the 1903 to. So he's very well known in the Vatic like talking about Vatican issues in the Italian press, and so so there is of course a difference between what the Pope says, what the bishops thinks, what the laymen thinks. So. Here, and maybe I should have said that also in the introduction, obviously the Catholic world is much, is very complex. And what is interesting is actually to look at how this kind of propaganda was interpreted by the highest ranks of the heart. What are the different connections between the different levels of the Catholic Church? Um, and that's obviously a very complex question because then you look at local, different local context. <laughs> but okay, now it is. Uh, so I'd like to thank very much for all of you who came here, very qualified audience. And I'd like to thank Nina for her presentation. Taking in her visit to Brazil to come here and share her knowledge. And agradecer ao Marcos. Uh, e pelo debate, as considerações, uh, o esforço, e muita força aí para a gente. <risos>